Therefore, it's time for question period. The Leader of Her Majesty's Royal Opposition. Mr. Speaker, my question is for the Premier. Multiple police investigation, corruption charges in Sudbury, allegations of government contracts being awarded in exchange for hefty donations to the governing party. The people of Ontario work hard to pay their taxes, and they don't deserve a government mired in scandal. They, they deserve to know that their tax dollars were not given away in exchange for donations to the Liberal Party. Mr. Speaker, will the Premier give the people of Ontario the truth they deserve? Will she call for a commission of inquiry to investigate the fundraising practices of the Ontario Liberal Party? Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. And I, I want to just remind this House and uh, to the, remind the people of Ontario in the, in the wake of, uh, of this question that this whole discussion about the changes to fundraising rules were in this context. First of all, that all parties. Uh, both sides are not doing me a favour, nor anyone else that needs to hear. Um, this will be my last generic comment. I'll move into individuals uh, one at a time, and I'll get you. Mr. Speaker, that all parties have been operating, I, I can only assume with integrity, have been operating with a, uh, from Leeds, with a, within a, a set of rules, Mr. Speaker. I had made an indication that we were going to move to change those rules, Mr. Speaker. We had already made some changes in terms of uh, real-time disclosure, Mr. Speaker, and putting limits in place. And so, Mr. Speaker, we are making those changes. We are moving ahead with those changes. We will bring legislation in the spring. But I think it's important to remember that, uh, that the context of this discussion was a need to change yes, the rules for everyone, Mr. Speaker, rules that we were all operating in with Never the from Supplementary. Mr. Speaker, back to the Premier. Just because this government brought in new rules for the Orange Air, it didn't stop the OPP from investigating a shady business deal. Just because the government brought in new rules for saving emails, that didn't stop the OPP from charging senior Liberal staffers David Livingston and Laura Miller for wiping away evidence of a scandal. So nothing this Premier can promise Minister about reform is going to change the fact that how this government has given out contracts and grants has to be subject to a full investigation. And I will repeat my question because for two days I have not got an answer. To the Premier, will she do the right thing? Will she call a commission of inquiry? Or is she going to wait for another police investigation into her government? Thank you. Premier. I'm going to go through once again what it is we are doing. I've talked about the context in which uh, this conversation has, has begun and is taking place. Um, as I said, we have already taken a number of initiatives. In 2007, we're the party that introduced third-party advertising rules for the first time. We introduced real-time disclosure for, uh, for political donations. As I announced last June, we're committed to making further changes. And As I have said, Mr. Speaker, our government plans to introduce legislation uh, on political donations this spring, including transitioning away from union and corporate donations. Um, that's why I made the decision that I talked about in this House to immediately cancel upcoming private fundraisers, which I have done, Mr. Speaker. Um, ministers can continue to do uh, small group high-value fundraisers, but uh, those events have to be publicly disclosed before they happen, Mr. Speaker. Start the clock. Wrap up. Wrap up. Yeah, and this minister will not be uh, ministers will not be fundraising with stakeholders uh, in those meetings uh, from their own uh, from their own ministries, Mr. Speaker. So it's important that we get this right. I look forward to the meeting on Monday with the leaders of the opposition party. Final supplement. Uh, Mr. Speaker, once again, uh, to the, House Leader. once again to the Premier, there's an expression, and it's, where there's smoke, there's fire. And boy, there is a 
lot of smoke right now. All of the Premier's talk of reform is really an admission on her part Chief that government there is whip. rot in this government, and the people deserve to know if this government is rotten to the core. They deserve to know if the companies felt obligated to donate in order to receive grants and contracts. They deserve to know if companies were filled that they had to donate in order to get a government meeting or contract. Mr. Speaker, why won't the Premier give the people of Ontario the truth? I will repeat again. Will the Premier call a commission of inquiry? Question. Thank you. Can you say that, please? Can you say that, please? Thank you. Premier. Deputy Premier. Well, Speaker, um, let's be clear. The, uh, the Leader of the Opposition is talking about big game, lots of bluster about this issue, but the truth is there's only one leader who is taking real action, and that is the Premier. So I ask you again. You are saying, why aren't you cancelling your secret private fundraiser, Speaker? I just Order, please. Order, please. Thank you. And member from Leeds Grenville, second time. Uh, and direct your comments to the chair. Thank you. Oh, I'd, I'd like the, the leader of the opposition to remember from Nipissing canceling his five thousand dollar a person uh, fundraiser at Barbarian Steakhouse. It puts a new meaning up to stakeholders, Speaker. The stakeholders at Barbarian Steakhouse. So why won't he just prove to us that this is not just political gamesmanship, Answer. but that he sincerely believes that we should put an end to that kind of fundraising? Speaker? Thank you. New question. The Mr. Speaker, my question is for the Premier. If the thought of calling a public inquiry is just too scary for this Premier to consider, then let me try a smaller step. This Premier said she would be open and transparent. She made mandate letters to her ministers public. Well, almost public. She didn't include the part about fundraising quotas. <laughs> Will the Premier, and this is a very important question, will the Premier release a list of every company that received a grant or contract from her government and a list of every company and association that successfully lobbied her government for a policy change? Yes or no? Mr. Speaker, the, the way that um, contracts are awarded and the way that uh, grants are awarded, Mr. Speaker. There are very strict rules around those. There are, there are procurement processes, Mr. Speaker. They are not political processes. Any more, Mr. Speaker, than I assume the development of policy on the part of the, uh, of the opposition parties has to do with their fundraising. Mr. Mr. Speaker, the fact is— I have an understanding of the— uh seriousness of the issue. Um, it's not helpful when it gets to the point where I literally cannot hear the response, nor does it helpful when the members of the same bench are uh, shouting out, uh, it does not help me in dealing with the opposition, and the same goes for the government on that side. So I'm going to ask everyone to tone it down. Thank you very much. I think it's very important that people know who gives money to government, who gives money government party, who gives money to opposition party. Answer. I think that the real-time disclosure of those things is very important, Mr. Speaker. That's why we moved to put those rules in place, and now we're going to Thank go you. farther and change the rules further, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, before, before I recognize you, it's not helpful uh, that I speak to somebody and the seconds later they start up again. Supplementary. Mr. Speaker, back to the Premier. My question was about the contracts the government is giving out. Sure. If this government really had nothing to hide, the answer to that question would have been a no-brainer. The people of Ontario deserve to, to know these lists. They must be made public so they can compare the list with the list of those donating to the Liberal Party. Based on what the media has been reporting, the public might find those two lists are pretty similar. So, Mr. Speaker, I asked the Premier this. 
Will she direct the Ontario Liberal Fund to return every donation received from the companies who got grants and contracts or who successfully lobbied for a policy change? Mr. Speaker, will the Premier pay the money back? Yes or no? As, um, as the member was finishing the question, I was going to stand to admonish for the second time the Deputy House Leader. Premier. So, Speaker, the, uh, the Leader of the Opposition is behaving like he is as pure as the driven snow, Speaker. But let's look at some questions, Speaker. So, for his leadership campaign, he received donations from estate planning companies. Uh, then he brings forward his very first private member's bill that benefits only them and their clients. Speaker, the OMA, the OMA sponsors the party convention, and next thing you know, they're up, stand, standing up demanding that doctors be paid more. Speaker, we know that the leader of the opposition is being invested. I have been hearing a couple of things in there that I'm not impressed with, and I sure, sure know that the members know they shouldn't be saying it. Finish, please. We know the Leader of the Opposition is being investigated by the Integrity Commissioner Answer. because he tried to sell off access to the West Lobby. So my question to the Leader of the Opposition is, how much do you have to donate to get a private member's bill? How much do you have to donate to get a question Answer. asked in a question period? As I have said in the past to other people asking questions that are borderline uh, making uh, uh, impugning motives, I'm going to tell the member that uh, she has not helped herself uh, and it will not happen again. Final supplementary. Mr. Speaker, back to the Premier. I've been asking serious questions about making the contracts the government gives out public, about paying the money back, and instead I hear smears and attacks. I'm hoping this time I can actually get an answer. If the government really wanted to show the public. The uh, member from Glengarry Prescott Russell will come to order. The, uh, the Minister of uh, Tourism, Culture and Sport, second time. And it sounds to me that there's going to be a discussion amongst all of you as to how fast you want me to get to warnings, so I'm going to get to warnings. So from here on in, individuals that I hear, not that there's a lot of you, uh, will get a warning. Please finish your question. Mr. Speaker, to the Premier, if the government really wanted to show the public that, that money didn't buy a meeting with a cabinet minister, they would give the money back. If this government really wanted to prove that the people of Ontario, that decisions they made were absolutely nothing to do with the millions and millions of dollars and donations to the Liberal Party, they would give the money back. But the Premier won't do that, Mr. Speaker, and that is why we need a public inquiry to shine a light on the Minister of Municipal Affairs and Housing is warned. Who's next? Please finish. Mr. Speaker, the government doesn't want me to finish this question. The reason we need a public inquiry to shine a light on the rot is just to find out how deep it goes. Mr. Speaker, the Premier knows full well where the latest scandal is heading. Answer. Why doesn't the Premier cut her losses, do the right thing, and call the public inquiry? Uh, I would suggest not getting yourself in trouble when I'm standing. The Associate Minister of Finance is warned.
Deputy Premier. Well, Speaker, I think it's time for the Leader of the Opposition to show some leadership on this, Speaker. You are, they are still stuck in the old ways. Exhibit A, the Toronto Leaders' Dinner is coming. The member from Leeds Grenville is warned. Finish. Uh, Speaker, the uh, Toronto Leaders' Dinner is coming up. I'm sure the caucus will all be there. Potential. Excuse me. The member from Stormont, Dundas, and Glengarry is warned, and the member from Prince Edward Hastings is warned. And you can turn sideways all you want. <laughs> Carry on. Potential donors are being encouraged to pay $25,000 for a so-called victory table, $10,000 more than the normal table. Now, but it's worth the money, Speaker. The extra $10,000 gives you the opportunity to host a caucus member. When it comes Answer. to Hastings, though, the more you pay, the more you get. By donating $30,000 or more, attendees will score an invite to a private reception. Thank you. New question, the leader of the third party. Thank you very much, uh, Speaker. My question is for the Premier. Uh, the Premier tasked the ministers of Energy and Finance to sell off Hydro One. They then hired a group of bankers to manage that sell off, and those bankers made a, a lot of money doing that, Speaker. And then those same ministers called up those same bankers and said, Come to our fundraiser and give us money. Now, just yesterday, that pattern repeated itself, Speaker. Those same bankers are going to make millions more selling off the next batch of Hydro One shares. Speaker, is the Premier really okay with this? Mr. Speaker, I know that the Minister of Energy is going to want to talk about the process. I, I just want to, I'm very aware of the young people in the, uh, in the legislature right now, Mr. Speaker. I am. Well, you can, you can heckle all you want. I just want to say, Mr. Speaker, and I want to say it about every member in this House. Every member in this House came into politics because they believe that there is more that they can do to help the people of Ontario. Right. Mr. Speaker, the fundraising rules that have been in place in this province have been followed by all parties. We believe that they need to be changed, Mr. Speaker, and I am going to work. I'm going to meet with the leaders of the opposition on Monday, and I am going to get their input on how they think uh, those changes should happen, Mr. Speaker. But I just want to be clear that it is my belief that this discussion is in the context of every party in this legislature following Answer. a set of rules, following the same set of rules, Mr. Speaker, and I have made the assumption about the opposition parties. I hope they've made the assumption about us Thank that you. we have all done that with integrity. Thank you. Thank you. I want to take a moment, please. Um, I've noticed a couple of people in the House have uh, devices that are open during question period, and I remind you of the rules regarding the use of devices. They are not to be used in any way, shape, or form uh, during question period with regards to uh, photos, uh, photos or taping or uh, that kind of th stuff. I just give you that warning now. Because if it appears on Twitter, or if it appears on anyone else, I'll be dealing with them very severely. Supplementary. Thank you, Speaker. Yesterday, the Minister of Energy said everything was fine with how the government picked the banks to sell off Hydro One. He said so because that process had been overseen by the former Auditor General, Denis Desautels. Did the Minister of Energy at any time inform the auditor that once the sale had started, ministers would be going back to the banks involved in the sale and asking them to contribute $7,500 a plate in a $165,000 fundraiser? Mr. Speaker, uh, as I said yesterday, I'll state, state it again today, Mr. Speaker, the former Auditor General of Canada looked at the whole process, the selection process, Mr. Speaker, and he signed off on it as being objective and fair, Mr. Speaker. But really, what's getting under their skin, Mr. Speaker, is a success of the Hydro One IPO and the secondary offer, Mr. Speaker. We're meeting our targets to get $5 billion to pay down debt, Mr. Speaker. We've already paid down enough, Mr. Speaker, to save $100 million a year in interest payments, Mr. Speaker. So it's paying huge dividends, Mr. Speaker. 
We're already ahead of our plan, Mr. Speaker, to invest the proceeds into the Trillium Foundation to build infrastructure, Mr. Speaker. And, Mr. Speaker, she's probably really disturbed, Mr. Speaker, the fact that the Answer. price of the shares of Hydro One since the IPO have gone up by over 15 per cent, Mr. Okay. Speaker. Speaker, I'm sure the Minister of Energy didn't answer my question, which was whether or not the Auditor General was made aware of the things that were coming afterwards, which was the request from these bankers to raise money for the Liberal Party. That was the question, Speaker. I'm sure the Auditor didn't actually have that information. After this small group of, of uh, bankers, Speaker, attended a $165,000 fundraising dinner, the Ministers of Finance and Energy gave them another slice of the Hydro One pie for dessert. How much will these bankers be earning to se for selling off the next batch of Hydro One, Speaker? Mr. Speaker, I'm sure that the uh, leader of the third party has heard a lot about what happened to the original IPO and the secondary offer, Mr. Speaker. The reality is, Mr. Speaker, that the fees that these bankers, and there were 16 of them who were in the syndicate, Mr. Speaker, there were not one or two or three, there were 16, as is normal in the process, Mr. Speaker, that, that the uh, the, the, the amount they paid in fees, Mr. Speaker, was almost unprecedented in terms of what they saved the province for a transaction of this size, Mr. Speaker. We should be proud of what they were able to deliver in terms of low fees. Um, stop. Well, no, actually, keep the clock going. Um, it, it's difficult when both sides are having conversations back and forth while the question is being put or the answer is being put. So this, uh, this announcement is for anyone. Uh, from any party, that the warnings will come even if you're trying to have a conversation across if it's disturbing. Finish, please. Mr. Speaker, I'll just read from the Globe and Mail uh, after the, uh, the IPO. Uh, the Globe and Mail noted that our government has persuaded Bay Street to accept Answer. some of the lowest IPO underwriting fees imaginable. Mail. And the same thing happened in the secondary offer yesterday, Mr. Speaker. Uh, thank you. New question, the leader of the third party. Here, my next question is also for the Premier. Uh, this isn't just about cabinet ministers, ministers suspect funding, uh, fundraising activity, Speaker. It's about the people across Ontario. After facing a criminal investigation for the orange scandal, a criminal investigation for the gas plant scandal, a criminal investigation for the Sudbury bribery scandal, the same Premier has now created a fundraising scandal that's shaking people's faith in our democracy. But she says. Only the Liberal Party can solve the problem that they created. Does she really think that's okay, Speaker? Mr. Speaker, let me go back to uh, where I started at the beginning of question period today, and that is to say that this whole discussion, you know, quite contrary to what the leader of the third party is saying, this whole discussion has come about, Mr. Speaker, because we were already on a track to change the rules. We were all operating. The member from Hamilton East Stony Creek and the member from Barrie are warned. Carry on. We had already introduced third-party advertising rules for the first time. We had already introduced real-time disclosure. I said last June that we were going to be moving in the direction of changing donation uh, rules, Mr. Speaker. I said in June, Mr. Speaker, that we were going to move in that direction, and so we—that's exactly where we are moving. And we were all. All of us in this House, all the parties in Ontario, were operating under Answer. the same set of rules. I think that there's a, a fair degree of consensus that we all need to change the rules, and I look forward to the input from the leaders of the uh, opposition parties. Thank you. Supplement. Speaker, a democratic system means that everyone has an equal voice, but people see a system here in Ontario where wealthy donors with deep pockets get one level of access to the decision makers and everyone else gets shut out. I believe that the facts say that ministers have broken the Integrity Act and the Legislative Assembly Act, and I look forward to the Integrity Commissioner's investigation and report. In the Sudbury bribery scandal, we have people on tape saying they were following the Premier's instructions. Do we again have a situation where the Premier is responsible for giving direction that may well prove to be against the law or in violation of the Act? Premier. Deputy Premier. 
Speaker. You know, uh, Speaker, it's interesting that the third party is trying to leave the impression that all the money they raise comes from bake sales and rummage sales and barrage sales and spaghetti suppers, Speaker. So let's just look at some of the uh, other fundraising that's happening. Uh, speaker, there was uh, recently there was a, a fundraiser at the Four Seasons Centre for the Performing Arts. I'm sure it was lovely. Limited to 10 guests at $9,975 a person. That happened in December, Speaker. That's not all. There have been other lovely events. A private stakeholder social at the Gardner Museum. I'm sure that was lovely too, Speaker. Limited to 10 guests only at $9,975 a person in April, Speaker. So let's just understand one Premier, one leader in this legislature has taken real. As a follow-up to my concerns, I will also start looking at the members of the same bench with warnings if they are interjecting while the answer is being put. New question. A third part, Speaker. A final supplementary. Sir. Thank you, Speaker. Look, I don't think big money should be able to buy special influence over government decisions. That's the bottom line, Speaker. And I think that Ontarians actually agree. Ontarians agree, and I think that they're concerned when they see a government selling access and then saying that they, and they alone, by using their majority, should be in charge of changing the rules. Speaker, I don't. I'm, uh, I'm insistent that we're going to do things the way that's supposed to be done. The Minister of Education is warned. Carry on. I'd love to see someone get kicked out here. I don't think people trust a government facing three criminal investigations to be in charge of changing the rules about fundraising ethics all on their own, Speaker. I don't think, I don't think people trust the party that created this ministerial quota system and the sale of access to decision makers to fix it. Does the Premier? Thank you. So, Speaker, the leader of the third party knows that the Premier has invited herself and the leader of the opposition to come to have a meeting next week to talk about exactly this issue, Speaker. So, nonetheless, the party opposite is it's time for them to uh, walk the talk, Speaker. There is another event coming up, which means another opportunity for the leader to show some leadership. A fundraiser at Leona Station coming up on April the 13th. Guests who are interested in joining the Leaders' Circle are asked to pay $9,975, but it must be worth the money because it includes access to the private reception taking place before the main event. So my question really is, will the leader of the third party continue with this event, this exclusive access at the private reception, or will she show some leadership Answer. and cancel the event? You see the first. Thank you. And again, I uh, apologize to the leader of the third party for uh, missing her final supplementary. New question. Uh, the member from Renfrew, Nipissing, Pembroke. My question is to the Minister of Energy. The Minister is one of the largest fundraisers for the Liberals by tapping, tapping into companies in his ministerial portfolio. Mm -hmm. He is one of the highest fundraising quotas in the Cabinet. And, his own and in his own words, he believes he's exceeding that quota. The minister to the Liberal Party is like a living, breathing ATM machine. Does the minister believe that it is appropriate for a minister of the Crown to raise large sums of money from stakeholders bidding on projects that are worth hundreds of millions of dollars, where he has the power to give a thumbs up or a thumbs down? Is that appropriate, Minister? Mr. Speaker, I'm not sure whether I've ever had a fundraiser 
that required ten thousand dollars, like the leader of the opposition, but uh, like everybody else in this room, like the leader of the third party and the leader of the opposition, Ms. I, I hosted fundraisers, Mr. Speaker, and raised uh, funds for the party, as as all of us in in this room have, Mr. Speaker. But you know, I think the anger and the angst over there, Mr. Speaker, comes as much from the success of what we're doing on the job, Mr. Speaker, and it's a great, great deflection, Mr. Speaker. I think that I think that the the critic for the for the Conservatives, Mr. Speaker, uh, is very surprised that the wind prices came in at 8.5 cents a kilowatt hour, Mr. Speaker which is unprecedented, which they never would have expected that wind would come in lower than the average price of generation in the system, Mr. Speaker. And, Mr. Speaker, I'll, 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 I'll have more to say in the supplementary. Supplementary. Be seated, please. Be seated, please. Supplementary. I think he Again, to the minister. Speaker. speaker, there's a reason why ministers' personal assets are managed by a blind trust, while those of backbenchers and opposition members are not. It is because ministers hold a tremendous amount of power that backbenchers and opposition members don't. It is to protect the public from the influence of money in politics. Combined, the seven successful bidders in his large renewable procurement round one gave the Liberal Party over a quarter of a million dollars. Oh, wow. Wow. Those companies who gave no donations were unsuccessful. Oh. As the saying goes, something smells fishy in Denmark. How can the public have any confidence that the same favoritism won't be the order of the day in large renewable procurements round two? Question. Minister of Energy. The independent electricity system app operator conducts all of the procurement for the renewables, Mr. Speaker. Uh, Mr. Speaker. Member from Addington. Addington is warned. Finish, please. Mr. Speaker, uh, we find out who the successful bidders are, Mr. Speaker after the ISO has notified the winners, Mr. Speaker, and after it's been made public, Mr. Speaker. We have a fairness advisor, Mr. Speaker, to act as a neutral, disinterested, and independent advisor for the procurement process. Published a report on March 10, 2016, following the announcement of the contracts. This report is available on the website, Mr. Speaker, and this is what the Fairness Advisor said. We are satisfied that the evaluation of the proposals was conducted strictly in accordance with the process set out in the RFP. We detected Answer. no bias or favoritism towards or against any particular proponent. And, Mr. Speaker, that Fairness Commissioner or the Auditor General, Thank Denny Joe's Hotel, could have checked the record every single day. Thank you. Please. New question, the member from Hamilton Mountain. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the Minister of Children and Youth Services. A week ago today, the minister proudly announced she was reducing the wait list for autism services by kicking kids off the wait list. Oh. More than 10,000 parents have signed an online petition pleading with the minister to reverse her decision to take essential therapy away from kids ages five years and over. The minister is actually telling parents that her only option to deal with the wait list is to start fresh. Really, the only way that this government can deal with the mess that it created is by forcing kids five and over to pay the price twice? The minister should be embarrassed, Speaker. Parents and medical professionals are not buying it. Will the minister do the right thing and immediately grandfather all children who are on the wait list at the time of her announcement? Question. Yes or no? Thank you. Minister of Children and Services. Well, Speaker, I want to thank my critic for the question, and I hope she takes advantage of our offer from last week to attend a briefing to get the facts, the facts of the $330 million investment in this program and the 16,000 
new spaces. And I've, I've heard her uh, in the media about uh, her suggestion to grandfather kids that uh, are on the wait list, the IVI wait list. Kids are over five. So I'm actually happy she agrees that the appropriate development window for intensive intervention, based on what the experts are telling us, is appropriate. She seems to agree with that. But, Speaker, let's be clear. What she is suggesting actually prevents children under the age of five from receiving the services they need. And if we follow that plan, Speaker, if we follow that plan, it will take four more years before children start accessing the attention and intervention services they absolutely need. That is not good, Speaker. That we have to have children in the right developmental window based on what the experts say. Thank you. It's all about this government's priorities. What is important to this government? Children are our future. Speaker, we've heard story after story from parents and families about the turmoil that they are experiencing. It's heartbreaking and, quite frankly, it's devastating. One parent asked the Liberals to imagine being told your child is too old to benefit from the therapy that just last week would have gave them the greatest hope of their life. A sibling of a child with ASD begs, please do not take away my, brother's, my little brother's voice for his future. A parent of a child who started therapy at the age of six became, became verbal. They started after the age of six, and they became verbal. That parent wants to know why this government is trying to silence other children's voices and futures. Question. Parents wonder why this government doesn't think that their kids are worth that investment. Parents want to know why this minister is punishing vulnerable Thank kids you. with autism. Thank you. The please. You see it, please. Thank you, Minister. Well, Speaker, this government does care about children with ASD. This government is investing more in creating more spaces. And, Speaker, again, uh, it's important that the member of the third party actually gets the facts straight. We are giving $8,000 per family immediately to those children who are on the list. If you want to listen, I'll tell you what it will do. It will take kids off. Minister. Speaker, children who are transitioning from the IBI wait list will receive $8,000 immediately for treatment. That means they're getting treatment now. They're coming off a wait list. And and I'll uh, identify the individual with a warning. And Speaker, when services uh, from that 8,000 expire, Answer. they will continue to be on the enhanced behavioral therapy program. Most of those children will be at the top of the list if they're not there already, and that service will be enhanced by three times. For what Thank you. Your question, the member from Halton. My question is for the Minister of Community Safety and Correctional Services. Minister, in my riding of Halton, we have two large correctional facilities that play an important role in our community, Maplehurst Correctional Complex and the Vanier Centre for Women. They house close to 1,800 inmates, and that's a considerable number of people and a huge responsibility. Mr. Speaker, I've met on several occasions with correctional services staff, and they often bring up the need for more officers in our institutions. Now, we know that our correctional staff work hard every day to keep our community safe. It is a difficult and important job, and we thank them for their tireless efforts. But we also know that to support the good work that they do every day, we need to continue hiring more correctional officers. In fact, correctional officers often explain that additional staff will help improve safety, expand programs, and Question. build a positive correctional system. So, Mr. Speaker, could the minister please explain what the government is doing to address this need. Thank you. Minister of Community Safety. Thank you very much, Speaker. And I, I really do want to thank the, the member for, uh, for Halton for her advocacy on behalf of our correctional workers in the province of Ontario. Uh, speaker, it is absolutely clear to me and everybody that I speak to uh, that the, the correctional system must be transformed. And, Speaker, we know that the status quo cannot continue. 
Speaker, we also know that our correctional services staff, including our correctional officers, are the backbone of our correctional system. And government recognizes that hiring additional correctional officers must be the first step in this transformation. Speaker, that is why we have already hired 710 new correctional officers since 2013. Wow. But, Speaker, we're not stopping there. Last month, I had the pleasure to join member from, uh, both members from Halton and uh, Burlington, along with Alex Suwiki and Gord Longi from OPSU at the uh, Ontario Answer. Correctional Services College, where we announced they will be hiring additional 2,000 new correctional wow. uh, officers uh, over the next three Thank years. You. Supplementary, the member from Burlington. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you for that answer, Minister. I was also pleased to join you for that announcement because, to me, it symbolized how our government is moving forward with the transformation of corrections in Ontario. It was also a powerful opportunity to witness public service in action and to talk to corrections recruits about their desire to make a difference in the lives of those they hope to help on a daily basis. I know, too, that the addition of these new corrections officers will make an important difference in the safe and secure operations of the institutions across our province and help to put corrections back in correctional services. That said, Mr. Speaker, as the minister works hard to add new corrections officers to the system, there are other challenges that need to be addressed. In addition to the need for more staff, we are hearing about the need to increase mental health supports for inmates and to develop more effective rehabilitation programs across Ontario. Minister, we already know that building bigger jails in Ontario is not the only answer to addressing these challenges, Question. nor is it the way to build safer communities in our province. So, Mr. Speaker, through you, will the minister please explain his plan to continue transforming corrections in Ontario. Thank you. Thank you very much, Speaker. And that, that's a very good question because the member, uh, the member is absolutely right that uh, that we need to to make sure that we transform the system. And the way we deal with the capacity issue, Speaker, is not by building more jails, Speaker, but in fact reduce the demands for jails. That's where the success will lie, and that's what's going to ensure that our communities are safe. And Speaker, that's it's important that for exactly that reason we invest in mental health training for our correctional officers and services for inmates so that we can provide them the appropriate care they need while they are in our care and custody. And that's why, Speaker, we have added, added 32 new mental health nurses across Ontario and work with CAMH to develop additional mental health training for those who work in our institutions and a comprehensive review of our segregation policy is also, Speaker, underway. In addition, Speaker, we are building a 122-bed regional uh, intermediate sir. center at EMDC. Uh, which is going to help uh, further. Uh, Speaker, there is a lot more to do, uh, and these transformations will not happen overnight, thank but you. we are committed at our end to get the job done. Thank you. Your question, the member from Lansing, Ted Minister. Well, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Uh, my question today is for the Premier. Earlier this week, the Toronto Sun reported on the dozens of private corporations who have both donated to the Ontario Liberal Party and received government grants. This includes corporations like Linmar, who donated $9,300 to the Ontario Liberals and afterwards received $1.5 million from the Southwestern Development Fund. Speaker, many other corporations like OpenTex have also made significant donations to the Ontario Liberal Party only to receive significant government grants afterwards. Mr. Speaker, why does the Premier support and engage in this type of pay for play? Minister of Economic Development, Employment and Infrastructure. You know, I'll, I'll, I'll accept that transfer, but uh, I, I, again, uh, we're getting darn close to the same kind of accusation of impugning motive, so I would ask you to be uh, cautious and find other ways to say what you want to say. I'm trying to uh, be as free as possible, but I need to have control of that as part of a parliamentary process here. Uh, Minister of Economic Development. Well, let me just say, Mr. Speaker, unequivocally, and I can say this without any doubt, unequivocally, our business support programs are completely depoliticized in their decision-making process. Absolutely, completely, without one shred of doubt, I can say that. What I can say as well is the majority of our... The uh, <coughs> order... You're, uh, you're adding yourselves to my list. The member from Beach, Beaches East York is warned. The leader of the third party is warned. And the member from Lambton, Kent, Middlesex is warned. 
Wrap up, please. So the question, Mr. Speaker, for Ontarians that they deserve to know is does the Leader of the Opposition support those investments that we've made that have brought $29 billion of private sector investment to Ontario, created or retained 160,000 jobs? Do you know where the critics stand? Stands. Where does his leader stand, Mr. Speaker? Or is he going to flip flop on this Thank issue you. like he does? Thank you. Supplementary. Mr. Speaker, uh, back to the Premier. Despite the fact uh, that in less than 10 years, Ontario's debt has grown by 91 per cent, this government continues to send taxpayers' dollars to private for profit corporations. In fact, this government has implemented a rigid fundraising scheme where it appears that Ontario Liberal donors are receiving preferential treatment and inappropriate government access. In order to clear the air, I requested a list of all corporate grants from the Ministry of Economic Development, Employment and Infrastructure back in January, but this morning I'd like to make a wider request. Will the Premier disclose all government grant and contract recipients and immediately refund all donations for any organization that received grants, subsidies, or contracts for which they lobbied the Liberal government. Our government has invested $2.8 billion, which we're very proud of, in supports for business, business investments that's attracted $29 billion of business investment, Mr. Speaker, and helped to retain or create 160,000 jobs. The question I think Ontarians deserve to know. I'm not stopping. The member from Renfrew, Nipissing, Pembroke is warned, and the member from Nipissing is warned. You have. I'm not suggesting challenging the chair. Thank you. Carry on. And Ontarians deserve to know is, is the Leader of the Opposition standing with his critic? in opposition to 160,000 jobs that we've recreated, or is he standing with us? Because, Mr. Speaker, when he was in Ottawa, he supported a government that partnered with us on many of those investments. So, yes, Mr. Sir. Speaker, is he going to flip on this? Is he going to flop on this? Or is he going to flip-flop all over the place so Ontarians have no Thank idea you. where he stands on this issue? Thank you. No question. The member from Kamala Rain River. Thank you, Speaker. My question is for the Premier. People living on reserves in Canada are 10 times more likely to die in a house fire than in the rest of Canada. The community of Pekanjikum knows this reality better than most. After last week's deadly fire that wiped out nine lives, three generations, Speaker, living under one roof. Does the Premier support the community's calls for an immediate coroner's inquest that will look into the social, economic and cultural factors that led to this tragedy? Good question. Mr. Speaker, I know that the Minister of Community Safety and Correctional Services is going to want to, uh, is going to, want to speak to this, but I want to just say that uh, this was a terrible tragedy, and I agree with the, uh, I agree with the community members and with the uh, member of the third party who suggests that there are, um, are very deep-rooted and uh, connected uh, challenges that a community like Pekanjikum is facing. I have been to Pekanjikum, Mr. Speaker. I have met with the band council, and I am very aware that the uh, the advances that we must make on education. Pekanjikum is one of the communities that doesn't have running water. There was uh, there is clean water on the uh, on the reserve, but it isn't connected to all of the homes, Mr. Speaker. And so those are the challenges that we need to move forward with. And uh, you know uh, we have we. We have strategies in place in terms of investment on the part of the provincial Answer. government. I'm very optimistic that now that we have a federal government that is paying attention to this issue, we are actually going to make even more progress, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. Right. Supplementary. Speaker, the community needs to know that just because there are fewer stories being written in the media today, that there won't be any less action from the government. Pekanjikum has a fire truck but no running water to its home, Speaker, as the Premier mentioned. It has overcrowded, dilapidated homes. The conditions are there today for another deadly fire. My question is, what is the Premier, not any other level of government, irrespective of any other level of government, but what is the Premier going to do to prevent another needless deadly fire in not only Pekanjikum, but in other remote First Nation communities throughout Treaty 9 and beyond? Here, here. Thank you. 
Mr. Speaker, uh, again, I will say that the, um, the challenges that are confronting uh, a community like Pekanjikum, but Pekanjikum in particular, are multifaceted, as the, uh, as the member has said. That is why our Minister of Aboriginal Affairs is working across government in terms of uh, economic growth opportunities, um, health improvement, uh, health outcome improvement issues, Mr. Speaker. We're developing a strategy, an education strategy, Aboriginal education strategy because we know that uh, Aboriginal Indigenous kids are graduating at a much lower rate than, uh, than the rest of the population, Mr. Speaker. All of those things are critical, but also critical are very tangible issues like housing, like water, Mr. Speaker, making sure that we get communities off boil water orders, that we hook up Answer. the clean water on Pekanjikum to communities. Mr. Speaker, this is a high priority of ours, and as I said, now that we have a federal government that's interested Thank in this you. issue, we'll be able to move forward more quickly. Thank you. Your question, the member from the Tobacco Centre. Merci, Monsieur le Président. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the Attorney General. Madam Minister, I know that our government is committed to ensuring access to justice for Ontarians. The finance, financing of legal counsel demonstrates this. This legal counsel allows vulnerable people to take charge of their own lives by having access to the legal advice they need. Whether we're talking about the courtroom, legal clinics, This program provides legal advice and ensures that Ontarians with low income have access to legal services of high quality. Madam Minister, could you inform the House, how is our government improving legal services in Ontario? Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I would like to thank the member for Etobicoke Centre for his question. It's a very appropriate and important question. Just like in the healthcare sector and in others, I think that access to legal help must not be based on, it must be based on need, people's needs. Last week, Ontario increased the threshold for legal assistance by 6%. This was the third increase over the last three years. Together, these three increases allow 400,000 more Ontarians to have access to legal assistance. When this increase will be in place, one million more low-income Ontarians will be qualified for this legal assistance. The improvement of legal services for Ontarians, our most vulnerable, is part of our government's efforts to create a legal a more fair legal system that is more accessible. I'm thrilled to hear that close to half a million Ontarians will benefit from our government's commitment to legal aid. Like the minister said, access to justice should be determined by need, not by income. Access to legal services improves outcomes in a number of ways for not only the individuals affected, but also for the system as a whole. By helping reduce the number of underrepresented parties in court, the justice system becomes more efficient and more cost-effective. Mr. Speaker, could the minister please expand on her current efforts to increase justice for our most vulnerable Ontarians? Thank you. So, Mr. Speaker, thank you again. And thank you again to the member for Etobicoke Centre. Expanding access to legal services for low-income Ontarians. This year's investment amounts to nearly $50 million. This government has invested over $3 billion in Legal Aid Ontario since 2003. Legal Aid Ontario offers a wide range of legal services to low-income Ontarians and is one of the most comprehensive legal aid systems in Canada. Through this funding, close to half a million more low-income Ontarians will have access to legal aid services. Mr. Speaker, I'm very proud of this government's effort on behalf of the province's most vulnerable, and I am committed to continuing to work with Legal Aid Ontario to ensure our justice system meets the need of everyone in this province. Merci, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. Your question, the member from Huron, Bruce. Thank you very much. My question is for the Environment Minister, Speaker. 
Yesterday, the Financial Accountability Officer testified before committee that he is becoming increasingly concerned with this government's lack of transparency, and he issued a warning. Things are only going to get worse. Speaker, in fact, he reported that he would likely be unable to access government documents that detail projects receiving money from the Liberals' cap-and-trade slush fund. Speaker, with this government's record of scandal and secret fundraisers, we know the Liberals cannot be trusted with such a secretive scheme. Will the minister explain why the Liberals are restricting the ability of the Financial Accountability Officer to investigate their cap-and-trade slush fund? Uh, <clears throat> I'm going to offer a uh, uh, stop the clock, please. Uh, I'm going to offer a caution on the use of uh, the words that uh, imply that there's uh, monies available to do different things. It shall not be used in the supplementary, and if it is, I'll stop the question. Carry on. Thanks, Mr. Speaker. This. Uh, process. I think you'd be hard pressed to find, certainly in any jurisdiction managing cap and trade, and, and quite frankly, in most aspects of pu public, the public sector in Canada, money that has to be so accountable, accounted for, Mr. Speaker. First, the money has to be entered into a dedicated account, which can be reviewed by the Parliamentary Budget Officer, the Auditor General, the Environmental Commissioner, and many other officers, including members in the House. That as it's expended, Mr. Speaker, it has to be accounted for. Every single project has to have the dollar amount, how the cost per millions of dollars of GHG emissions reduced, Mr. Speaker. It has to be aligned with a five-year action plan. We have to file an investment plan that does it every year. It is reviewed by my ministry when separately evaluated and then reviewed by Treasury Board and, and Cabinet. Could the member suggest any other reviews that, that that or what higher standard because it's higher than Quebec, higher than California, Thank you. higher than Japan, and higher than all of Europe? Thank you. <laughs> Supplementary. Thank you, Speaker. I just did financial accountability officer access. Okay, oh. So again, back to the minister. The Liberals are forging ahead with their plan to impose a new tax on gasoline and home heating, but they don't want to explain the details to the financial accountability officer. Instead, behind the cloak of cabinet secrecy, the Liberals plan to funnel $1.9 billion into their cap-and-trade discretionary fund yeah. so they can dole out more cash for, you guessed it, their pet projects like more renewable energy. Speaker, the minister is restricting the financial accountability officer's access so the government can hide their discretionary funding to companies that attend Liberals' high-value $6,000-a-plate fundraiser. Is this truly what's happening? Can the minister address this? Yes or no? Answer. Thank you. <laughs> minister. Uh, <laughs> Mr. Speaker, we, I worked very closely with the Environmental Commissioner. I chatted with her on the phone this week. We worked very closely with the Parliamentary Budget Officer. The Parliamentary Budget Officer has to review all spending plans before they're done, has very broad powers. And, Mr. Speaker, the Parliamentary Budget Officer has not asked me, nor I believe they asked this government, for additional powers. I continually talk to the officers of, of, of this legislature. We performing at a higher standard than any other. But, Mr. Speaker, I'm a little confused by the member opposite. The member opposite this morning announced that she wanted to cancel vehicle emissions testing in Ontario, so we can't test vehicles for emissions. Um, we, the, the, the I, uh, it's almost wrap up, but the member from here on, Bruce, please. Carry on. The member opposite and her party voted against the cap and trade bill with the higher standards. Answer. The member opposite has yet to propose a single idea on how to improve transparency. And the reason for that, Mr. Speaker, is because we're exceeding Thank all you. international standards of transparency. Thank you. Your question, the member from Niagara Falls. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, my question today is to the Minister of Transportation. Ontario's private winter road maintenance contracts extend only to March 31st. But last week, there was a major snowfall and more plowing was needed. And so the contractors got more work and more money. Even though the government is tr still trying to collect performance penalties from these same, same contractors, the government thought the best solution was to hire a company they have already levied fines against for not doing the job properly. 
Why are taxpayers of Ontario giving these private contractors even more work and more money when they still owe millions in penalties for the work they failed to do in the first place? Uh, <clears throat> thanks very much, uh, Speaker. I thank the member for the, uh, for the question. So, a couple of things to remember about our highway maintenance contracts. They are not season by season, Speaker. <clears throat> they are, in fact, year round contracts. The contractors that have a particular contract area, including, for example, the area contract that would cover, for example, Niagara Falls, it's a year round contract, Speaker. Specifically with respect to the equipment complement that's required for winter maintenance. Um, in some parts of the province, including in parts of southern Ontario, as of April the 1st, and this is not new, as of April the 1st, our contractors in a given area are permitted to actually reduce the complement of equipment that they provide. So as of April the 1st, it would come down to 50 percent. Of course, everyone here knows, because I say it repeatedly, and I think this is true of all of us in this legislature, Speaker, making sure that our roads and our highways are safe yes, at sir. all times is extremely important. And that's why MTO, recognizing the weather forecast that existed prior to March 31st or prior to that last snowfall, reached out to our contractors to make sure that we could be in position to provide the service that your constituents want, that my Thank constituents you. want, and that the people want. Never too late uh, to get a warning. Supplementary. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, on the Niagara Falls contractors, as you're aware of, uh, they didn't perform their job last year and they have moved on. Uh, and long-term contracts are a whole other issue. Mr. Speaker, back to the Minister of Transportation. The government has entrusted the safety of our roads to private contractors, but is it unable to enforce these contracts. Even though these contractors own the public millions in penalties for poor performance, instead of forcing them to honour the agreements, these contractors get more work. The minister is stubbornly sticking with his failed privatization system when these millions in penalties prove that these contractors can't be trusted to do their jobs and keep our roads safe, which is probably the most important thing of this. Why does he insist on sticking with failed privatized system that endangers Question. that endangers our kids and our grandkids. Thank you very much. Thank you. Minister. Uh, <clears throat> thanks very much, uh, Speaker. Again, I thank the, uh, the member who's my critic for his follow-up question. Uh, I think, at least based on the way that the question was conveyed just a moment ago, it sounds to me like there's a little bit of a fundamental misunderstanding uh, on, the, on that member's part with respect to how our contracts work. Having said that, Speaker, uh, everybody here knows that my number one priority is to make sure that Ontario's roads and highways remain as safe as they've been, Speaker, for the last 13 years, ranking first or second across all North American jurisdictions for safety, Speaker. And that's why the Ministry of Transportation reached out to the contractors in question to make sure, given that we all knew what the weather forecast was, that we had the equipment necessary to provide that level of safety for the people of Niagara, for the people of Vaughan, and for the people of Ontario, Speaker. We'll continue to work closely with our contractors. We'll continue to implement our action plan, Speaker, following up on the Auditor General's recommendations from her report of months ago. And we'll sir? continue to move forward and improve the program, Speaker, and I would expect all members on all sides can support that. Thanks Thank very you. much. New question. Member from Trinity Spadina. Thank you, Speaker. Uh, my question is to the Minister of Environment and Climate Change. Uh, speaker, through you uh, to the Minister, uh, on this side of the House, so we know the importance and we understand that climate change uh, is, not a, is, not, is, is not a distant threat to uh, Ontario. It is an issue I hear a lot about uh, in, uh, in my writing of Trinity Spadina. It has devastated communities, damaged homes, businesses, crops, and increased insurance rates. And that is why our government is moving forward with a plan to implement a cap-and-trade program in Ontario. It is clear that a cap-and-trade system is the best method for Ontario to reduce GHGs while uh, simultaneously growing our economy. I understand that our government's public discussion and consultation on cap-and-trade goes back Question. almost a decade. Can the minister please inform the House what our government is, has done over the last decade to consult and prepare for the cap and trade? Thank you. Minister of the Environment and Climate Change. Thank you uh, very much, Mr. Speaker. You know, I, I've said a few times that uh, the, probably the two things that have been most studied in, in science by human beings are cancer and climate change. There's never been two larger research, um, research initiatives really in human history. 
Uh, our government, when we see our first auction with the, the Legislature of Ontario willingly passing the bill uh, in early 2017, that will celebrate a decade of working on cap and trade and carbon financing. We, we actually started uh, in 2007, Mr. Speaker, when we joined the Western Climate Initiative and founded what became really the first successful large-scale car carbon market. We launched, our, we launched our first cap and trade consultations in 2008 in a discussion paper, the first of four discussion papers that we've issued over the last yes, decade, Mr. Speaker. In, in, I will continue in the supplemental, Mr. Speaker, but we work on a weekly basis with environmental groups, consumer groups, and in industry drafting this legislation with them. Thank you. Supplementary. Thank you, Speaker. And I want to thank the Minister for his uh, very important work on the cap and trade program. In con coming off the United Nations conference in Paris last uh, December, I believe there's a real momentum in reducing greenhouse gas. Ontario is about to join global movement towards putting a price on carbon, and it is the most effective to be uh, an early adopter. Soon, more than 90 percent, um, the Canadian 90 percent of the Canadian population will be covered by carbon price. In Ontario, our proposed cap and trade will limit pollution, reward innovative companies, and create more opportunities for investment in Ontario. Can the minister please inform the House as to the recent consultations with stakeholders and industries that were undertaken? Thank you, Minister. Thanks very much, Mr. Speaker. I want to thank the member, member for Trinity Spadina, who, who is my next door neighbor uh, in the legislature here, uh, for his leadership. And you know, those of us who, who are parents or grandparents, I think, fully understand the weight of these issues, Mr. Speaker. Um, this is an incredible trading opportunity. As you know, we're creating a freestanding marketplace in which there is bidding and allowances. The consultation with financial experts, legal experts, is to create this so that it has an integrity, and the trading happens without fear or favour, Mr. Speaker, based on establishing a real price on carbon sufficient to reduce emissions, Mr. Speaker. It also involves all Ontarians, all Ontarian, all Ontarian consumers and businesses, Mr. Speaker. I know when I'm wrapping up uh, because the the pricing system creates opportunities for trade Answer. and investment. It puts a price on pollution, but it also stimulates investment. So our consultation has to be very detailed, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. Pursuant to uh, Standing Order 38A, the member for Huron-Bruce has given notice of her dissatisfaction with the answer to her question given by the Minister of the Environment and Climate Change concerning the Financial Accountability Officer's access to cap-and-trade funds. This matter will be debated next. I want to make sure everyone understands what a late show is. This matter will be debated next Tuesday at 6 p.m. The Minister of Training College and University is on a point of order. Mr. Speaker, Mr. Speaker, please join me in welcoming Consul General of Turkey, Mr. Erdeniz Shah, sitting in the Thank you. Welcome the member from Windsor to come see on a point of order. Thank you, Speaker. Just a reminder that Kelly uh, Simcoe and uh, Simcue and Caleb Ellis are here with their jersey of courage. We'll be able to sign the jersey outside the main doors, and that's to make sure that we have a safe workplace in Ontario. Thank you. Thank you. I thought I saw someone else starting to rise. Nobody? There are no further deferred. For votes, this House stands adjourned until 1 p.m. this afternoon.